Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to the ALG Summer Webinar Series. Thank you so much for joining us, or if you are watching the recording, thank you for watching. Uh, today we are hearing from CJ Robinson at the University of North Georgia uh, on reciprocal success, the benefits of open pedagogy for both students and instructors. There will be participation and opportunities for questions. So please feel free to post questions in the chat or hold on to them for when it's time. Um, and if you are ready, BJ, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Thank you, Tiffany and Jeff, both of you. Um, and thank you all for joining uh, this, being here to talk about the benefits of open pedagogy to both students and instructors. Uh, my plan is for us together to consider open pedagogy concepts and benefits relating both to HIPs, um, then dig further into what is open pedagogy, then consider general and specific examples of open pedagogy based assignments, and finally to brainstorm how to apply open pedagogy to assignment and or course design. But throughout, I really do keep asking do you have any questions? So um, thank you, Tiffany, for mentioning that because I do want this to be interactive as much as possible. Uh, because of much of what we'll be discussing is intended as an in introduction, at least up until the brainstorming session, I prepared a references and resources document to share with you, as you can see on this slide, and hopefully in well, and also Tiffany also said that she'll link the document and PowerPoint slideshow on the ALG website afterwards, um, which I'm sure will be done before I blink an eye. <sighs> Much of the OER movement focuses on the real benefits of OER for students, such as, oh, I think there's already a chat. I'm sorry, I'm going to be interrupting myself quite a lot. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, if, if it's easier for you, um, feel free to ignore the chat while you're presenting, and then when you're ready to uh, take questions or to answer anything from the chat, I, you can just let me know and I can start reading things to you. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. Okay, so much of the OER movement focuses on the real benefits of OER for students, such as affordability, equity, and inclusiveness. It also focuses on how instructors may use OER to students' benefit. Using open pedagogy encourages OER adoption as it's student learning only possible through the internet and digitalization, as is OER. Um, OER adoption, which again, offers students affordability, equity, and inclusiveness. Robin DeRosa and Scott Robeson define open pedagogy as a quote, student-centered teaching approach that empowers students as creators of knowledge and opens resources, end quote. It does so through authentic assignments or non-disposable or renewable assignments intended to help students achieve experiential learning and demonstrate engagement, which can be achieved through autonomy and choice engagement, diversity, and reflection through OER. And open pedagogy also provides students these OER benefits, engagement, diversity, and reflection, as well as such additional ones as autonomy, collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, lifelong learning, and more. Reciprocally, reciprocally it does the same for instructors by suggesting teaching possibilities and methods for them to achieve these goals in their course learning outcomes, objectives, and assignments. Indeed, students and instructors can collaborate on outcomes. For example, with course deliverables assignments being selected by students with instructors facilitating the selection assignments, course, content, teaching, material, and the like. That's what um, instructors and students can collaborate on with, uh, to collaborate on. In this way, open pedagogy can be a strategy for HIPs. So I am gonna ask right now, does anyone have any questions so far? 
And a more general question, has anyone collaborated with their students on developing course outcomes or assignments? Feel free to turn on your microphones or to use the chat for these participation and question uh, opportunities. I'm probably going to have to count to <laughs> specific time. OK. I tend to be impatient, so I'm probably going to move ahead, um, but that doesn't mean we won't, I won't pay attention to any forthcoming um, questions or responses. OK. Open pedagogy and HIPs. Open pedagogy seems a strategy, strategy relevant to several, if not all, HIPs. For example, as with collaborative assignments and projects, open pedagogy can instill diversity, can help students see different perspectives outside of their own, as Alamo.edu describes the effects of such assignments and projects. Um, and I'm going to ask each time, does anyone have um, in, want to share any of their collaborative assignments or projects? And even if you don't share right now, keep these things in mind, uh, these questions or your assignments or projects in mind, because that's what we'll be bringing on storm, brainstorming together, I hope. Okay. Also, open pedagogy can help students, as with any undergraduate research project, explore answers to questions, to real world questions. Um, and I'm sure you have you taught or used undergraduate research projects. And if you'd like to share those, um, I, I would love it and I appreciate them. Appreciate that. And as with diversity in global learning, open pedagogy can allow students to learn about worldviews that differ from their own making them more aware of such topics as racial and ethnic differences or gender inequality. Any examples of diversity global learning focused assignments you'd like to share? Oh, OK. Nice. Yeah, we do have in the chat from Jeff. Um, we had a grant project um, from one of our recent grant rounds that created this I, it, it's called remote mentoring um, undergraduate research, and uh, they it's sort of a, a like an online uh, training kind of on uh, to help students figure out how to do undergraduate research, um, and that's what Jeff has linked here. Um, it's nicknamed Rementors. Oh, nice! Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Bronwyn Hegarty in Attributes of Open Pedagogy, a model for using open educational resources, ascribes these attributes to open pedagogy. Participatory technology, people, openness, and trust, innovation and creativity, sharing ideas and resources, connected community, learner-generated, reflective practice, and peer review. In eight qualities of open pedagogy, next thought adds to these attributes. Agency, choice, expansion, student constructed, open endedness and unmeasurability in terms of being dynamic and open as opposed to static and closed. These yeah, oh, uh, sorry, I wanted to uh we have a question in the chat um, from Virginia Rowling. I had not thought of asking students to come up with outcomes for their assignments, but like that idea. Have you done this in the past? And if so, how do you go about this? And what were the outcomes? Uh, well, we'll be talking about this more later. I've done it so far in a creative writing course um, open, and I'm going to be talking about uh, an assignment in that and an outcome in that on um, creative writing to pub for creative writing for publication. And generally, um, 
one thinks that students will be ready to share their works in creative writing because publicity publication is supposed to be the end goal but uh, their rights and their audiences they're really not aware of that or how they can market their work to these specific audiences so i've built in um, outcomes like how do you know your audience can you find them can you reach them and then i ask students um, what are some genres that you're interested in are exploring together? And that's when we will focus on um, publishers that focus on those particular genres and things like that. Is that this is where I, I've, I've learned that I always, almost always, every time I give an answer, go ask, does that make sense? <laughs> This is kind of a dangerous question to ask because it may not make any sense, um, but people tend to be polite. Oh, uh, thank you. And I hope um, to, uh, I hope we can talk further about it when we get uh, further down in this presentation. Okay. So again, these attributes of open pedagogy seem to me to reflect what alamo.edu notes as common elements of HIP strategies. They require student effort and commitment to learning. Um, and, you know, which comes first, the chicken and, egg, and, and the egg, as someone asked me once about that. And I think they come together. It's a wonderful, like, maneuver, like, burst from the brain. Uh, they help students engage one another across differences, thus challenging the uh, challenging students to develop new ways of thinking and responding to new people and situations provide students with rich and useful feedback, helping them to see feedback as a tool for growth and improvement. Oh, okay. And help students apply what they're learning and adapt the information to new situations. Okay. I'm gonna stop and look at the chat. Oh. Yes, I will be, that is definitely something we'll be talking about in terms of what it means for students to help with outcomes and their assignments. Um, but thank you, and I'm sorry to be distracted like this. I tend to be like a puppy dog in that regard. Uh, but they help students apply what they're learning and adapt the information to new situations, and they afford students the opportunity to self-reflect and become aware of themselves as a person, as well as encourages lifelong learning. Any additional questions? Uh, yeah, student learning outcomes. It could be objectives. Um, it could be even assignments. There are many ways to incorporate this. And uh, one thing I will be saying later is that tradition, so-called traditional or non-disposable uh, non assignments can be scaffolds for preparing for the open pedagogy because just introducing students to what open pedagogy is um, or what it means to publicly share one's work is something that one should start from the very beginning to talk about. So, do you have any questions or comments so far on HIPs and open pedagogies benefits? Okay, um, like, let's say you're teaching a perspective course on technology. I hope you don't mind my reading this out loud. Um, they might have an interest in video production. Yes, that the instructors didn't anticipate and unearthed it in the first class. Learner-driven outcomes would mean adapting at that point, including that video centered outcome. That's a great example. And I've heard it described as um, spaces, just making spaces available. You will always have your own framework for your class. Um, I always, I mean, I'm not gonna speak for you, but I always have all my outcomes and the assignments prepared. But within that, I have a space, a small window for student participation in that regard. And Jeff's adding you could do that at an individual letter level if you have a course where you're able to give that level of attention and personalization. One on one is uh, the dream, um, but also student autonomy uh, is a real benefit of open, uh, open pedagogy. So helping students be able to express that desire and being able to teach themselves and teach their how to share what they've learned uh, is a, an important, I think, benefit for students and instructors alike. 
through that sort of collaborative outcome. OK, so uh, what is open pedagogy? According to David Wiley, open pedagogy is the quote set of teaching and learning practices only possible or practical in the context of the five R permissions of retain, reuse, revise, remix and redistribute. Is adopting OER a form of open pedagogy then? It can be. It can also be how students learn or demonstrate what they've learned from that OER. Contrasting open and constructionist pedagogy to clarify his meaning, Wiley notes that a constructionist pedagogy only encompasses learning by making, while an open constructionist pedagogy also encompasses learning by revising and learning by remixing, things you can do only when working in the context of OER and the five R permissions. The Rosa and Robeson expand on Wiley's, Wiley's explication by noting that, quote, the basic premise of an open pedagogical approach is one in which an instructor guides students to curate and create new knowledge, empowering them as public contributors of ideas through open content as they learn and grow in their disciplinary knowledge. Thinking about the five R permissions and the learning practices they make possible, such knowledge curation can include collecting, selecting, assembling, and presenting information or multimedia content like images, music, and the like for other people to access and learn from. OK, so uh, let's see, I don't want to miss anything. I think Holly Miller is the first to say I teach in an actual program in health professions. They learn most of this in patient care procedures and in the clinical set setting. The students are graded by the clinical site precept pre preceptors they work with who give them feedback. Excellent. I also have them do writing assignment after each clinical shift. Whoa, and it just shifted at that very moment uh, to reflect on what they've learned. And I think it is what we're talking about, but then the students will make learning objects and make that public. And this is something to, that we'll be talking about later as well, but they can make it public by sharing it on the internet or by making it available to future iterations of the course so that they would teach it um, in that way. Uh, OK, so Jeff, could you read your um, your I'd love to hear other voices than my own. <laughs> Can you read your let's say that the students shared out what they've learned? Yeah, so um, <laughs> Holly had shared, you know, she teaches a, a program in health professions. Mm -hmm. And um, students share what they personally learned uh, after they're graded by uh, their their clinical preceptors, and that's you know that's definitely a a personal type of learning. But to do it open, to to do like open pedagogy kind of things, students would be sharing what they're learning with the world, uh, yeah. kind of making it public, knowing that they're going to be publishing it, and uh, you know agreeing to publish it in a larger space and maybe even open licensing it in a way that others could then take that idea or what they learned and maybe they make a, a video out of it or a, a script for a skit to teach a particular thing that happens uh, in, uh, in over the course of nursing clinicals or something like that. Um, that's kind of one way that open pedagogy can, can work like that. And then I just shared a link down below to uh, Virginia Commonwealth's RAM pages. Um, they are, they, this is a WordPress driven platform where students in a whole bunch of different courses um, do for their assignments things that can be shared out in the open and public. Uh, the top one in their site-wide activity at the moment is fostering collaboration between uh, student and physical therapists and student mm -hmm. physical therapist assistants. Uh, it's really neat to see all of these different kinds of student perspectives on stuff that they're doing. Great, thank you so much. And I agree with you on all of that, um, and then some. So to 
expand on what or build on what uh, Jeff just shared, creating new knowledge encompasses using five R's to create new learning objects, most often in the form of non-disposable or renewable assignments. In defining OER-enabled pedagogy, John, David Wiley and John Hilton use these four questions to determine whether or not an assignment is open, that is renewable or non-disposable. Are students asked to create new artifacts like essays, poems, videos, songs, etc., or revise or mix existing OER? It's not quite open, but it's considered disposable. Does the new artifact have value beyond supporting the learning of its author? Those would be considered authentic assignments, according to David Wiley and um, John Hilton. Are students invited to publicly share their new artifacts or revised remixed OER? That can be constructionist uh, because it's there are many ways to share. Uh, and then the final one in terms of open pedagogy, are students invited to openly license their new artifacts or revised remixed OER? Notice that invite doesn't mean require, and that's something that needs to be considered very carefully because students um, they have to know what their rights are they might want to protect their identity they can anonymize they can um, pseudonymize what they share but they should always have a choice uh, and yes this is, we'll be talking about that too uh, these questions can also be asked to determine whether course uses open pedagogical methods. Uh, any questions? <laughs> oh, I love this. Yeah, I think that's crucial. Um, and the idea of diversity, it's, uh, I think inclusiveness and autonomy and self-representation, I think that's one of the things that open pedagogy helps with because if students have the choice and if students find the way of sharing their work, they will be included almost automatically. And yeah, Jeff, please do share everything. You, it's really great. Um, so, any other questions? Deep breath. Okay. So now, general example examples of open pedagogy assignments, and these come from um, open the open ed group. They include writing or editing Wikipedia articles. And from a writer's point of view, I think that's interesting because they have rigorous standards and editors who will help students uh, state their knowledge in a way that protects themselves and also contributes the new knowledge. Also remixing audiovisual materials, creating or revising, remixing open textbooks, and creating open text or quiz banks, collaborative or social annotations, or their own open assignments. Uh, what, the process of education is inherently coercive. Oh, yes, it's true. I think that's a statement. Uh, the process of education is, in, is inherently coercive. It's tough to know your rights and believe you have that choice. I think that's part of where the benefits to instructors are that that idea of collaborating with the students and um, that they that we are that an instructor can be a facilitator can be presented fairly or open. But I think and I think um, that is a way to help students feel less coerced, but uh, again within a framework. OK. Oh, I love this. Um, nice. Jeff, did you? Oh, Veronica is an OER super, superstar in Alaska. Oh, I wish we could have a shot of your. Um, oh, thank you for being here, and I appreciate that. OK. Uh, Sarah Hutton, Lisa D. Valentino, and Paul Musgrave also add students creating screencasts to explain difficult concepts as a general example of open pedagogy. Some of the qualities that make them open pedagogy based is that they are renewable, accessible online, exist beyond the original course's time frame, and can themselves be revised and remixed. These qualities are what causes them to be called non-disposable versus disposable or renewable assignments. 
The handout includes other examples of open pedagogy based assignments. And please note that, as I said earlier, open pedagogy based assignments may require traditional assignments to build toward the final publicly shared open assignment. Uh, OK, yes, we will. There's a, oh, I think Gian Johnny uh, within the open notebook. I'm looking at Troy Smith's very interested in the open test banks idea and have been considering various tech solutions for this. Uh, I think uh, Gian Johnny and I do have a reference to the open notebook in the, the handout does give a guidance on how to develop it, how to develop open test banks and um, goes through the process of testing students, how they create it, what's expected, um, and how they finally decide on the, the questions that they've created to include in um, test banks. Okay, so now we're moving it, like, to like specific examples of open pedagogy assignments. Open pedagogy, and these are all mine, so sorry for suddenly get, becoming the center, but it's not. Open pedagogy assignments should start with making sure students understand Creative Commons licensing and what their own rights and risks are when either using or creating open resources. ALG's website has, as you know, lots of information for this. ALG champion librarians are also important resources. Libraries have LibGuides and librarians may do class presentations or have recorded workshops on Creative Commons licensing too. But that's something that should begin early on in terms of the traditional assignments, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, OK, so the press participated in a continuous improvement grant for the World History One Culture, States and Societies to 1500 open textbook. The authors developed instructor resources, including lecture outlines for topics related to each chapter sections. For example, chapter one section included one on human beginnings in Africa and the hominid evolution. They also developed assessment tools, including multiple choice questions, short answer essays, and essay topics that refer to the textbooks questions to guide your reading. Oh, Tiffany, can you read out? I'm sorry to trip myself again, but I'm going to keep doing that. Tiffany, can you read your response? Your what you just put put into chat? Your quiz bank was created. Yeah, so um, I was just I was responding to uh, Troy's request for anyone with resources that might help um, with the tech uh, the technology of doing uh, open test banks. Um, and so uh, my, I have an open textbook that I manage um, and we have a quiz bank that was created by student assistants um, and we share that uh, by we have a, an online form on our textbook website that is manually uh, uh, reviewed and, and uh, responded to. Um, which means that I do have to do my own research on that person uh, that is requesting the quiz bank, um, but it really only takes a few minutes to do so. I mean, most uh, in, most institutions have a an easily uh, found directory of instructors, and you can search for them there. Um, and all I do is just confirm that they really are an instructor at the institution that they say they're from, and then uh, I send them the I send them the quiz bank through email. Um, and so I just I, I included the link to our textbook website because we do have our request form there, and it just asks for really basic information. Um, you know, what's your name? What institution are you from? What course do you teach? And uh, and then, and then their email address. So it's a it's a manual solution, but uh, it doesn't take too much time to do, uh, at least until we get the right technology to do it automatically. Thank you. So the rubric for all of the instructors ancillary material included its relevance to the textbooks, learning outcomes, development of the subjects, concepts, diverse materials, resources and media. Diverse learning styles like uh, group interaction, independent and or creative work, active learning methodology like critical thinking, research skills and problem solving, 
and overall congruence within and among the chapters. What the authors created met the rubric standards by drawing from the World History eCorp class plan, linking to websites and podcasts as diverse media resources, offering suggestions for topic-focused fo classroom or group discussions, and suggesting activities like defining key terms. Using the same criteria as that for the textbook authors, ancillary materials, but I designed new open pedagogy-based assignments closely tied to what the textbook authors created. Several of these assignments were for a collection of annotated timelines template that was added to OpenALG and thereby made publishable. For example, one of these assignments asked students to socially annotate the hominid evolution, the Paleolithic period or the Neolithic period chronology within the larger history timeline. This emphasized the larger context in terms of course material, but also open pedagogy that is making the collection of annotated timelines publishable on OpenALG added the larger context. And this is, to me makes it really worthwhile in terms of all of the HIPs of students creating this material for not only their immediate classmates, but also remote audiences accessing their publicly available annotations. Audiences who may never have formally studied World History One who want to learn about it and so need different kinds of information from that shared within the classroom, as well as establishing different kinds of authority to speak on the subject, logic in approaching the subject, and persuasion in appreciating the subject. Right now, I'm working on a fully online, online version of a UNG course, the Creative Writing for Publication I mentioned before. One of its outcomes is that at the end of the course, students will have demonstrated the ability to plan their professional platform for the purpose of publicizing and marketing their creative work by drafting their bio, literary resume and blog, literary resume and blog, newsletter or website team. And I'm looking at, uh, oh, Tiffany, that's great. Getting good um, interaction there. So for this outcome, how can I use open pedagogy to achieve this outcome? For the blog newsletter or website theme, I plan to ask students to analyze author blogs, newsletters, or websites, giving them a range of authors and authors of various genres from which to choose, as well as components they should consider. To ensure inclusiveness, I will then ask them to identify the blog newsletter or website's target audience and explain how they know. I will then ask students to make suggestions on how the blog, newsletter, or website's targeted audience might include them or noted success at including them. Then I will ask the student to add those suggestions to the blog, newsletter, and website as a social comment. Their options will include blogs, newsletters, and websites that allow social comment, for example, as a feed. Alternatively, they could include these suggestions in a review of their selected blog newsletter or website that will be added to a collection of such reviews that will be part of a final course module on resources for writers. Please note that I plan to give, please note, sorry, I plan to give students choice on how or even whether to publish their work. How students will make their work open is important to consider. I've included a link to a sample agreement for students to consider and sign in the handout. Students should be able to choose not to make their work open or to, as we said earlier, or make it open anonymously or with a pseudonym. And their choices of how their work will be published can, for example, be on a fully public platform like an institutional repository or open ALG or via future iterations of any course. I will keep building the final module on resources for writers from this course to use in future courses ad infinitum. Do you have any questions about specific open pedagogy based assignments that we haven't had a wonderful opportunity to consider yet? OK. So, oh, so how to apply open pedagogy? 
to brainstorm ways to apply po open pedagogy to already developed and new course assignments and or already developed new courses. Please consider this question Heather Michelli asked about one of her courses noted in an article she co wrote entitled Library Support for Scaffolding OER Enabled Pedagogy in a General Education Science Course. And the question is, what would a renewable assignment look like in my core 101 class and what support would it require? Open course design could be through, as we said, as I said earlier, deliverables, assignments left open to student choice. It could also be designing course outcomes intending to teach open pedagogy based attitudes, skills or knowledge like inclusiveness, autonomy and the like. And with these possibilities in mind, please consider these components of learning outcomes. This is from a learning outcome generator that I've had so much fun, like a puzzle working with and it's included in the handout as well. Uh, the link, uh, the no, these are the components of learning outcomes, as I'm sure you all already know, but it's fun to work through together, I hope. Uh, the knowledge, skills, or attitudes you want students to learn and be able to display. The taxonomy you want to use, such as Bloom's Cognitive Taxonomy or Fink's Significant Learning Taxonomy. The level or dimension you want them to learn and be able to display the knowledge, skills, or attitudes how you want them to display the knowledge, skills, or attitudes, and what will the student do to show you the knowledge, skills, or attitudes? So for this brainstorming session, please consider an assignment or outcome in mind um, that you can share with us. Uh, if not right now, then um, as we go forward. And Tiffany, I think you've gone on. Could you read your response to sure. begin to consider? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, you were talking about making sure that students know that they don't have to share yeah. you can also share anonymously. Um, and so I was just providing a link to uh, some example assignments that actually turned out to be failed assignments. Um, they were designed for a class that was not advanced enough for these assignments. But in the uh, description of the assignment, uh, we give students information about how to license their work with the CC BY license, how to indicate that they don't want to share at all, um, mm -hmm. and also how to indicate if they want to share it but maybe not have their name on it. Um, so we sort of give them those options, and, and this, that link gives you some uh, example verbiage for if you're trying to do something similar. And one thing, thank you very much for showing that. And one thing um, with the categories of um, assignments that we consider with the World History One, it could be like PowerPoint slides, image galleries, um, discussion, shared discussion or presentations, um, or biographical essays and all of that, but they would be collected at the end of the course and the collection could be totally anonymous, but collected and then put on um, open ALG for people to read uh, or access as they choose. So there are many ways, I think, but it does take time. And um, I think it's always good to get feedback. I love getting feedback on my own outcomes and my methods with my colleagues. So, you know, get it. and that includes Tiffany and Jeff, I'm grateful to say. So things like that are important to consider. So um, considering the how and what aspects of the last two learning outcome components is how you want them to display the knowledge, skills or attitudes and what the student will do to show you the knowledge, skills or attitudes. Along with Heather Michelli's question, ask yourself how can these components include your, you know, asking them to create new artifacts or revise or remix existing OER, giving the artifact value beyond supporting the learning of its author, inviting students to publicly share their new artifacts or revised remixed OER, and then the final one, inviting students to openly license their new artifacts or revised or remixed OER. So, does anyone want to 
throw out a, an idea that they're considering so that we can offer feedback together or brainstorm possibilities. Uh, going back, and I again, I'm really impatient, so I apologize as uh, you're all considering this. But going back to the, I think the the science, the health one, where the students worked with, um, darn, it's way at the beginning. Oh, I'm finding public blogs. Okay. Wow, there's been a lot of input. Uh, the one where the students were working with uh, an instructor for the patient care procedures and clinical settings and that were graded by the clinical site preceptors, if that was recorded, for example, how and the feedback was recorded, for example, what framing would one want to give so that this information would go beyond the classroom itself, how it could contribute to uh, open resources, or if there were already a video, for example, prepared or such that such such a an interaction, how somebody could remix it or take a part of it from the video overall to, I guess to share and make it more pertinent for a particular class. So, Tiffany, could you read, I said perhaps a Google form, could you read that? Because I'm not even sure. I've lost track of a little bit as I was trying to backtrack. Um, yeah, um, so we, uh, Troy Smith and I have sort of an ongoing conversation happening here in the chat <laughs> um, <laughs> about potential uh, technology solutions for collecting uh, questions like quiz questions uh, for students, um, and but in such a way that doesn't require too much manual work uh, on the back end to organize them. Um, and so initially, I was saying maybe a collaborative document or a wiki um, that students all work together on. Um, but he's looking for something that uh, would keep the questions that each student. Uh, submit and the answers to those questions hidden until they actually take the quiz later. Um, and so my final, my most recent suggestion was to maybe do a Google form that outputs to a spreadsheet uh, with a whole bunch of technical, like how to do it information <laughs> in the answer uh, here in, in the chat um, as maybe a, a, maybe a possible solution to that that would uh, sort of export to something clean and easy to manipulate. Um, so that's what that was. Cool, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go back to the general examples because one that tends to be fairly popular is creating a revising or remixing textbooks. And I'm assuming it would be open textbooks. Uh, it would have to be in order for it to have those opportunities. Uh, but has anyone done anything like that with open material where you or your students together revised or remixed. <laughs> I mean, a very early example, which I treasured, but at the same time get my teeth at, was were people sending out corrections that students caught to some of our textbooks, which is great. Um, but and it uh, <laughs> yeah. and it's the reality that you know no matter how many eyes look at something, there's always going to be a typo or something that's been overlooked. And I think also um, social annotations can be very interesting in terms of what a lot of textbooks, or what I find a lot of textbooks, open textbooks can benefit from, which is explaining material that uh, the the sort of the ancillary or resource material that instructors have, but have students ask very basic information, like for example, an image from a, a literature one open textbook, like what with Queen Elizabeth the first, what information do you need to have to understand the meaning of this image? Or if someone could, students could do those sorts of things as well with 
the material itself. What do I need to know? What am I missing? What are some ways to um, understand? And that can be socially annotated. I think um, OpenALG has wonderful um, social annotation opportunities and people and students can, this is a collaborative work, work on it together and give feedback to each other. Uh, Troy is saying that's, uh, okay, that's pretty much what I did. Troy, are you, do you have a mic where you could read or your own response or do you feel uncomfortable? I can wait a second. No, I can do that. And I don't, oh. as, as Tiffany said, this is kind of a side conversation going on. Uh, just as a quick background, uh, for several years I taught a memory and cognition course, and one of the things that was a key element of the course is how you can improve your your learn memory and basic elements of learning. Uh, one of those being uh, testing yourself using testing effects and retrieval as a key element of learning. Yeah. And so I incorporated that concept into the way the course was built, where every week students had to submit their own questions. And then I would use those questions. So that was an activity of itself. And then I would use those questions to create practice quizzes that they could then take to retrieve. And then I would also pull about 20% of the questions for any given exam from that bank, uh, as well as using the test bank that came with the textbook. Um, and what I've been searching for is a way to do that more efficiently and to allow that to be open so it goes beyond that one course uh, and that's that's kind of where that side conversation is going kind of talking about some of the technical aspects um, on how to do that um, again I don't want to derail the, your larger presentation oh. uh, but that's kind of what that side conversation is about I think thank you for sharing that and I think that's a real consideration that instructors I mean digital literacy is a concern for students I mean opportunity for students in using open pedagogy but it's also a need for instructors um, I've seen many websites on how to create a t an open textbook um, a how to develop a video and is it the John, John Gianni um, open textbook, open notebook talked about how to create an open text test bank. Um, these things do require learning, I mean, learning and sharing together. And a lot of that has been made available. I think um, probably for the, per the idea of students, anybody accessing quizzes or texts tests questions on OER through OER uh, the self the self testing I think those are safe but otherwise I think using a mock form or a Google form like um, Tiffany mentioned is crucial because you do have to protect it um, for the instructor's sake otherwise it's really not a resource um, for them it's a resource for students but not just for them. And Veronica, um, I don't even know. Oh, partnering with one another to model the skill. Oh, could you go back and give the context for that, Veronica, if you feel like sharing or um, speaking out loud? I, yes. Yeah, thank absolutely. You. Just responding to Holly's comment about uh, when working in the medical space, you know, you've got the the HIPAA concerns. You couldn't use an actual yeah. client to model the the skill that or the competence that you're trying to assess for with the student, but maybe using another student or, or a willing volunteer who could role play the part of the, the client. Yes, that's a great idea. And I mean, if you've ever been in a dorm where health students are you know, studying biology, uh, I've been uh, pulled aside to be used as an example of someone in an accident needing um, triage. And um, it can be a lot of fun and a great way to startle the people that are asking for your help or to model for them uh, what they're hoping to help. That's a great point. And any other um, input like that? Uh, I don't want to, I would love to hear your ideas. Um, oh, Jeff, could you share? <laughs> yeah, so this is an early uh, example of something like this. Uh, Maria Gallardo-Williams at NC State 
uh, had an alt textbook project grant, and what she did was her students created uh, lab tutorials, and they weren't things about like the content of the labs, but they were about uh, stuff about lab safety and procedures. So it was students teaching other students how to do stuff in the lab, and uh, that was all openly shareable. And now they've got a channel on YouTube with all of those videos as well. So I posted a couple of links, uh, an article about the project, and then one that was the videos themselves. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, any any other responses? Because clearly I can keep on talking. <laughs> Hold a mirror up to my face and I'll be that <laughs> person. <laughs> I'll never stop talking. So it feels a little bit like that right now, and I don't want to do this. I'll never be alone if I hold up a mirror to my face. But um, I would like to give you guys a chance. I would love to get your input. Um, somebody who hasn't spoken yet or shared anything yet. See, I'm counting out loud now. Uh, um, Ferpa, okay, Belamina Radke, I hope I'm not mispronouncing it. I'm curious about Ferpa and sharing assignments when they are graded. I, I think you, uh, I have no idea how to make this work for college algebra. That's so interesting. Um, and then I assume it's just pulling a policy and reading it, but I'm curious whether it came up in terms of the FERPA and sharing the assignments when they're graded. I would, I, I think you do need to get permissions, but I don't think you can share assignments that are graded, just like students can't essentially plagiarize from their own work, but could develop something new. Like I think Jeff mentioned in terms of modeling what's been done. Um, and oh uh wow everyone's responding so fast this is wonderful anyone who wants to put a mic uh, um open up and speaking it would be wonderful uh because um yeah i think the grades should be done elsewhere and including students voices and contributing their own ideas creating examples and scenarios of where the a formula algebra would be useful. And also, I think somebody said to me once, I really, I'm, I'm going to embarrass myself with my lack of knowledge of algebra, but generally mathematical principles don't change that much. And there's a lot of open material textbooks out there with algebra and just having students look, comparing your textbook with an open one or with different ones, almost like comp titles, like what is being gained with this text versus another one? What's information that can be expanded on and developed? Uh, what can we contribute on any of these? Uh, okay. Jeff, can you read? Uh, you, you, you and Tiffany are very, very um, kind in responding to my request for, can you share your responses? But yeah. I, thank I mean, you. there is a, a little bit of, uh, I mean, there are some discussions here about making sure to protect students privacy and absolutely this is something you would you would need to do when you're planning this out. Yeah. Um, open pedagogy assignments don't tend to be like, hey, let's share out all of your D2L assignments with all of my grading on them and hey, you made a typo here and I marked it in red and now the world can see it like you no. wouldn't want to do that, obviously, okay. um, but if you uh, have students agree that like a particular assignment where they are either, uh, for example, the thing we were talking about, creating a tutorial for other students, um, creating uh, an essay on their perspectives on doing something related to the course or uh, connecting their course materials with a book they're in, something like that. If they if they agree to share that stuff out, then that's great. Uh, there are plenty of reasons why, why you may not want to. Uh, maybe you have an assignment where you, it, it, the truth needs to be said, but it's so personal that you don't want it out there for the world. And yeah, uh, there are also a lot of different uh, learning, and dis learning disability accommodations mm -hmm. that um, wouldn't be amenable to just sharing all of your stuff out in public too. Uh, that 
it needs to be taken into account. There shouldn't be a penalty for anybody saying no. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say students would be active participants in getting that stuff published. It wouldn't be a surprise for sure. Yeah, from the beginning. And I think the handout does have like how to explain to students what open pedagogy is. I mean, really just explaining to them what it is, why it's useful, um, then moving into examples and how they can incorporate it. I mean, that does need to start from the beginning. Um, oh, Judy, thank you. I'm I'm skipping names. Ian Kraus uh, mentioned. Ian, could you read uh, your response if you wish to or not? Honestly, I was really uh, I I like the idea of uh, someone said uh, let's get a question going uh, every week from the students, and I love that idea. Mm -hmm. I think it will help them to be a bit more meta about their uh, their own education. Yes, and, uh, and someone above said they had no idea how to incorporate this in algebra and I was like well that's that's where I'm going to start. Yeah and I think the getting as many students involved in that as possible that would move into diverse learning styles which I think is what Jeff in terms of like making things accessible to all students um, and you know the, the, the so-called diversity that we all have but uh, I think the reality is diversity only exists within a group. So when you get the group together, even if it's a larger public, then the diversity can be responded to through uh, various learning styles. Um, thank you for sharing that. I think Judy orton Crisette said something which I would love it if you read out loud and anyone just please jump in at this point. Hey, PJ, it's Judy. Um, I was just commenting on a project that my colleague uh, Feng Ru Xu and I have been um, working on um, where um, we have had students um, uh, create um, questions and then um, up here in the class would review their question and provide um, feedback um, and would use kind of like a great, you know, a rubric, an evaluation rubric. Um, so on different dimensions and so um, we use that as kind of a, a way to um, you know help kind of improve the questions but also to allow students to think critically about you know kind of questions and the process and try to increase student engagement there um, so so that was what my what my comment was was there and we did that in a um, introductory level human growth and development course in psychology that's excellent. Thank you for sharing. Um, and when you mentioned rubrics, I mean, again, going back to um, books and textbooks for peer review, publishers should make available what their own criteria, the rubric they give to reviewers. I mean, we all like the public framing can be and ought to be made available to people because we're not, uh, you know, sub rosa. We're not, you know, spying on each other. Um, Peggy, I think your question, how would this improve their proficiency? Um, I think that would be, for me, it's the idea of critical thinking, but could you read your, um, your response if you feel comfortable, but not if you don't? Uh, well, the question, how would this improve their proficiency? And you can interrupt me, is like, could there have, ha have them provide questions? Do they have to provide answers? Do they need to be correct? They are anonymous and or not required. Then how do you assign grades or evaluate? If no grade, no one will do it. That's a, a reality. There's such a thing as participation grades, but also the final project can be um, the only part that's graded. Uh, but in terms of providing answers, I think that's something John Johnny goes into. Like you have like multiple questions is the most commonly used one where you have the the answers there are at least two close to but not quite correct answers and i think in terms of um, those choices they're in there um okay i think oh it's three o'clock my goodness <laughs> i hate that i apologize i'm gonna stop yeah so with with dr mock's question i mean there's <clears throat> there's a lot here and a lot of cool stuff to explore. And I think some things that open pedagogy people are asking themselves and doing research on at the moment. But I will I would say it if you're gonna go the route of students publishing anonymously, 
um, you would just want uh, your ecosystem to stay the same. So maybe in public they publish anonymously, but you know in D2L or places like that, they could submit their assignment to you and you could be submitting their grades and just per normal. Um, and how it would improve their proficiency, it really would depend on the subject. I mean, if you're teaching in the humanities and you're writing for the whole world to see, then obviously you are uh, crafting something very similar to what they're going to be doing. And if you're working in the health field and uh, submitting tutorials and things like that, well, if those folks are ever going to be uh, preceptors themselves, then they would be teaching their fellow uh, nursing students and uh, same thing with technologists, doctors, etc. cetera. Uh, so they may wind up with a little bit of pedagogical experience out of the whole thing. But yeah, I mean, it, there's a big, it depends to all of this, but you would want to plan things out the way that you would want your class to run still for sure. Yeah, cool, thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, I appreciate the time that you've given um, to this. Thank you. And that's my email in case you want to email me at any time. I'm always happy to keep on learning. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us um, and thank you BJ for doing this presentation. It was uh, wonderful. We had some really mm -hmm. great uh, participation and conversations going on in the chat um, that I think some of us would probably have continued doing well into the next hour. <laughs> so Almost if, <laughs> yeah, so if you are interested in continuing these conversations, um, I think that it's safe to say feel free to reach out. Um, and I do, uh, I, I will just throw this out here. Um, the UNG Press is about to do a really cool open pedagogy project. So if you're interested in hearing about that when it's official um definitely maybe like follow them on twitter um <laughs> because <laughs> it's a very exciting project um that a few of us actually who are here are involved with so um more open pedagogy coming um and uh yeah thank you everyone for joining us and uh you know i'll, I'll go ahead and stop our recording now but again thank you thank you Thank <laughs> you.